Well, thanks for joining us here on the Melbourne Catholic website, which goes out to literally thousands of people all over Melbourne, Victoria, Australia and the world. And I'm joined today by Bishop Robert McElroy. He's the Bishop of San Diego, appointed a couple of years ago. San Diego is America's seventh largest city, big Hispanic population, which many people may know. Uh, and welcome to beautiful Melbourne, Bishop Robert. Great. Well, it's a delight to be here with you, Shade, and it's even more of a delight to be here in Melbourne. Yes, and we've got a sparkling day for you. Uh, we're going to cover a couple of topics. Uh, I know you're on a bit of a, uh, a speaking tour as you move around our beautiful country and our great city. Let's start. I know you're a, a great proponent of this whole concept of social justice, and we hear it all the time uh, in, in our common world, in our Catholic world. Just in, in its most simplistic way, what to you is social justice? Well, to me, and I think to the church, social justice is the notion that there are implications in the message of Jesus Christ which take their reality in terms of public policy and social policy. And that if we really consider ourselves to have the compassion of Christ in our hearts and souls, and really to consider ourselves to act justly in the world as the scriptures call us to, that has implications. Now, it's not always easy to see what those implications work out in the concrete to be, but it certainly is an imperative. And if we look at how Jesus spoke about the needs of the poor, the outcasts, the marginalized, we can see this is not something peripheral to Catholic faith, it's something very much at the heart of Catholic faith. And social justice is the commitment to the, to the idea that we seek to live that out here in this world, in this place, as situations are evolving, and try to say, what would Jesus do in this case? What would Jesus do if he were in San Diego and looking at the situation in the United States? What would Jesus do if he were here in uh, Melbourne and yes. looking at the, 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 the questions of major public policy that, that, that Australia faces in the world today? So. It's a real Pope Francis bandwagon, is, is, is my outsider's view, it seems to be. Has it been something you've been very much a part of for a long period of your life? Yes, I would say it, it, on one level, it's, it's, uh, Pope Francis is, is bearing witness in a prophetic way to this idea of social teaching in the life of the church. But in a very real way, it's, it's a long tradition in the life of the church. You know, trying to live in a Christ-like way in the world has been a part of a Catholic faith and, and the Christian moral life since the beginning. Sure. But it's generally since the age of industrialization that what is called Catholic social teaching came yes. to be more articulated. And so, and, and, and particularly in the Pope since the Second Vatican Council. You know, uh, Pope John the Twenty Third, Pope Paul the Sixth. Pope John Paul II, yes. who, who was a great advocate of social justice, and the whole of what he was doing in Poland, in the society as a whole, was a call to a level of justice against oppression in the world. And then Pope Benedict and now Pope Francis. They have their different ways of pointing to the reality of social justice, but the core teachings have been evolving over a period of time with some constants. So here we are in June 2017. And a really basic question. Sure. How are we going? Well, in every age, there is a series of questions that the world faces anew. There are new social realities. And so uh, Catholic social teaching calls us to grapple with those new social realities. Catholic teaching is based on the principles of Christ and the gospel, but they come into play in specific historical, cultural, economic circumstances. Depending on the time. So, depending yeah. on that, and sure. in every age, you know, if, if you looked at the period after, dur during World War II and during World War I, they were great crises for the world, and the world was able to face that, but there were tremendous questions of justice there. Uh, and, and similarly, in the period of the 1960s and 70s, with the emergent questions in the world of colonialism, of, of ethnic and cultural change, and what does it mean to have multi-ethnic societies, yes. those questions were yes. emerging. And we face a series of, of, of very powerful questions in our own day. You know, what, what does it mean, uh, the questions of the environment, say. Uh, we're, we're on the edge in certain ways 
in terms of how we're treating the world and the sustainability of the world and the steps we take now now have a profound difference. How do we deal with the onrush of refugees in the world and immigrants who are facing terrible situations? How do, how do we, um, those of us say in San Diego or here in Melbourne, yeah. in Australia, uh, uh, how do we face that in a way that's responsible without getting overwhelmed? These are the uh, questions that in our own age really are very, very powerful. How do we make sure in our own societies that people aren't marginalized economically or socially or culturally? Uh, those are kind of never-ending questions, but th they're taking on a new po po poignancy in our own era. Uh, Something uh, I'm sure a lot of people now watching us are probably hoping I might ask you is talking about what you just said. How can we be Jesus in the world? How can we do better? Here in Australia, we've been pretty disgraceful in the way we have handled and treated refugees, the whole Manus Island question, you may yes, or may not yes, be aware yes, of it. Yes, 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 yes. What can we do as just everyday Catholics? Is there anything practical or more we can be doing to try and help what sometimes to people looks like an immovable object? We just can't actually help. Well, uh, there are two levels of action of this. One is the level of the society as a whole. And so all of us are citizens of the nations in which we live, and we have an effect on public policy. And so to to try to uh, propel the public policy toward a more Christ-like approach on these questions, that's one level. Mm -hmm. But it, there's also the personal level. Are there actions we can take yes. toward understanding refugees, or toward supporting them in their integration here within, within the society as a whole, those refugees who are being allowed in, are there ways we, we can help better the life of refugees who are living on the edge? Those are things we can do on our own without a change in the public policy mm. occurring. And so we've got to, uh, the call of the gospel is both those things. Yeah, exactly. so like so much in Catholicism, it's both and, it's not either or. And so. Laudato C si yeah. has been to my way of thinking, one of the more profound and oft quoted of the encyclicals of the last 40, 50, 60 years. What does it say most to you? Is it the whole question on the ecology? Uh, what does it speak to you of? Um, a couple of things. One is, interesting enough, you would asked earlier about the progression in Catholic social teaching. Pope Benedict was the one who was called the Green Pope because he, he brought the, the environment really into mainstream right. Catholic social okay. teaching. Yeah. And, and Pope, Pope Francis has built on that. But in Laudato Si, Francis, uh, Pope Francis reduces questions to a very understandable level. I and basically what he says is, our common home, which is the earth, is under grave and dire distress because of what we are doing yes. as, as human beings. And so we have to understand this is an alarm bell. The crying out of the world in its agony, the earth, uh, is an alarm bell to us that unless we act, we are going to de be depriving future generations of a sustainable world and maybe of a livable world. And, and that is a huge challenge for us. Uh, and it's, it's one in which it's not simply a dire question. It is a dire question, but it's one amidst great hope because new technologies have emerged which allow us to change course on this, which allow us to live differently and not entailing huge sacrifices for us. The technologies of, of solar power, wind power, and so forth, uh, of sustaining water and clean water, these now have come to a point and are, are going to continue to develop such that there are good choices we can make if only we understand the realities that face us and have the will to make them. And uh, in fact, this is the situation in Australia is much better than in my home country, mm -hmm. the United okay. States, because in the United States, the, the notion of climate change denial is an industry, J just as as it was when uh, the ma cigarette manufacturers <laughs> poured money into false science yes. about tobacco and cancer. So now there's a false science that's grown up in the United States and has a surprising grip on a significant number of Americans. Don't worry, it's permeating and, here a yeah, little as well. And, well. Yes, but 
Um, we're in the asylum on it. You're you're just you're just uh, you're, 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 you're tottering. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, uh, it's stunning to me. Because good people have been sucked in by this notion uh, that it's a real open question: Are we doing it? any harm in terms of climate change. And so we have to start with that. What is the reality? And then again, I just think in all these justice questions, the most important thing for us is to, is to say, what would Jesus do if he were in my situation? And I think uh, my, my mother used to ask me that question, you know, when I'd want to do something that I know wasn't exactly the right choice, but, and I'd want to justify it to myself. She said, well, what do you think Jesus would do? And I wouldn't know what Jesus would exactly do, but I know it wasn't darn well what I wanted to do, <laughs> and so did she. And so I, I do think we just have to keep coming back to that question regarding these complex uh, topics, and Jesus would want us to engage on behalf of humanity and, and specific men and women and children and families and, uh, and then climate change t toward the survival of the earth, which is a gift of God from creation. I went to a seminar a little while ago on ecological justice, mm -hmm. uh, a, a most interesting title. Yeah. And I must admit my eyes glazed over when I saw the title. I was trying to make some sense of it in my own mind. But listening to the discussion, it, it really did open my eyes to the fact that uh, it's got to be more than just sitting on the fence and looking and trying to make up your mind. There is some real action items here that we can all be trying to move forward with. And there are two elements to it, in my view. One is that those who are poor and marginalized in this area of life also get the worst uh, uh, end of the stick. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it's just, it's, it's, it's like, so that the poverty is bad in certain places and it becomes accentuated by the environmental effects, the loss of land, uh, the, the loss of clean water. Yes. And so that's one end of uh, uh, ecological justice. But, but the other is that there are these opportunities for us to make a substantial change with some sacrifice, but not enormous sacrifice as, as, a, as a human society to really better the situation of the world. And that's a real key, quick question of justice, because once again, not just ask us what would Jesus do, but you know, as children and grandchildren of the next generation are going to ask their parents, why did you make this choice? Or why did yes. you make this yes. choice at these critical turning points in the society on the, on the environment? And, uh, now, Peter's telling me I've got a couple more minutes, okay. so I do have to uh, sure. act within the parameters of time, <laughs> Bishop Robert. <laughs> But I did notice when I was reading your background, a really interesting bit of work you were doing back in the early 90s. You got a PhD in political science from Stanford, and you basically looked at the role that ethics plays in foreign policy decision-making. Now, that's 25 years ago. Yeah. So if I fast forward to 2017, I would be irresponsible not to ask you with that knowledge and with that experience, where do you see the Trump America of 2017? I, I would say uh, a couple of things. One is, I fear in the United States we're falling into a politics of grievance and division right. that, that cannot lead to any sound ethical outcomes. And I see us rushing toward this um, it, it's partly a partisanship that partisanship that has become very deep within American society over the last 10 years. It, it predates uh, President Trump, but it, it's accentuated now. Um, there's also a cleft within American society, uh, kind of between rural and urban uh, society in the United States, and in a very real sense, between those areas which have uh, done well in the globalized era, yes. and those who have not. And hence some of the voting patterns of That's the, some of the voting recent patterns. election. And it's cultural. <laughs> right. it's, it's not simply did you do well economically, although that's part of it. But it's also cultural, you know, between uh, one of the great problems is uh, among many elites in American society, there is a disdain for um, traditional patterns of thought on a variety of issues, and even religion itself. That's very uh, 
distressing and harmful in American society. So uh, those all detract from any effort to even get to a discussion of ethics. Yes. You see, for example, we're now in the middle of this health care debate, and I said repeating, repeating health care, frankly, that's what it's going to do. It's going to build a new health care system on a house of sand that's going to collapse. You are far ahead of us. We are. Yeah, you yes. are. Yes. You are. And, 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 it, and, and it's, it's amazing to me that the United States, which has so much wealth and so much technological creativity and uh, energy, is so far behind on this vital area. Of, I thought of Obamacare world. had taken you quite a way forward. It has, but, but and well, then, what, what happened was when, the, when, the, when Obamacare was constructed, and it had to do with parliamentary elements in the United States, of and what you could do or not, they weren't able to fix some problems. And so it always, always, Obamacare was always hobbled by certain elements of it, and they couldn't address those because of congressional restrictions on what they can do, actions. But, uh, but as a result, but it was a step toward comprehensive health care. Now mm. that's all Don't. threatened, mm. you know. And so, um, but as all this debate's going on, it, it's, it takes place in secret. It's, it's against such a high level partisanship. There's not even an ethical discussion that takes place. That's, that's when you're asking where we are on yes, that, that ethics yes, question. Yes. What I lament is, it's uh, so often impossible to even get a hearing for a discussion on a substantive ethical grounds about whether a policy is good or bad. And, uh, because so much energy is wasted on partisanship, on these clefts of culture and, and, and uh, marginalization in the economy, so that, that the, the ethical questions don't even get visited. They're too remote. And so that's a great problem. Perhaps. We've covered some ground, sure. and uh, that's been a marvellous sure. chat. I, I thoroughly appreciate it. Well, uh, Bishop Robert McElroy. And I'm going to go out and see more of Melbourne today. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, and we, we, we hope you feel very yeah, welcome. Yeah. Um, but please uh, take our best wishes. Yeah. Uh, have a safe trip here. And uh, thank you very much for your genuine honesty and uh, y y your wonderful view. It, it, it really was very elucidatory. Great. Lovely to meet you, Bishop thanks, Robert. Thanks, Shane. Okay, good.